Good morning, everyone. We continue to wend our way through the text of Esther. Um, and if everything, I think we should be done in two lessons, two more lessons after this. So I know it's supposed to be a lesson per verse, but we're kind of speeding it up a little bit. So, um, <clears throat> so kind of as a backdrop, you know, as, as kind of what's happening, of course, uh, the evil nemesis in, in, the, in the story of Esther is, uh, is Haman. <laughs> I have to make sure I don't mess up the names like I was doing last week. Uh, and so, you know, and he has kind of a inherited hatred. I mean, it's kind of been a hallmark of, of his people. Uh, and so when, uh, when Mordecai disrespects him, he says, well, I'll get you. And he, and he gets King Xerxes basically to craft an edict, which is going to get rid of all the Jews. Now, Xerxes doesn't really know which group he's talking to, but the way that Haman explained the situation, he goes like, yeah, this is bad. We've got to get rid of people like this. This isn't good for the empire. Okay? Now, remember the historical, which isn't, the historical backdrop, which isn't covered in the book of Esther, is that, uh, you know, during the time, I think Esther takes place a period of maybe like 12 years total, something like that. And uh, during, during uh, the time period of the book of Esther, um, you know, the Persians, the Persians fight the Greeks and, you know, they basically lose their navy and never recover though their army is still strong. But what will happen is after, you know, Greece, Macedonia, from where Alexander the Great is from, is on the ascendancy, and Persia is on the descendancy. Now that, it'll still take a while before that happens, but Xerxes is aware of kind of this growing power which, which will be a competitor on the world stage, and so he wants unity in his empire. So it kind of, it's a lot easier to promote when you, when you see that, wow, there's a threat and we have to be unified. And here is this group of people who are not, you know, towing the Persian Empire line, okay? Esther becomes aware of this and so she, she ends up having two banquets. She has one and it only invites Haman and uh, the king, okay? And, it says, and the king says, well, what's going on? Why'd you, why are you having this? Well, I'll tell you tomorrow. And so, um, and then so she had the, the feast the, the next day. And of course, where we finish is last, last week, she kind of sets things up and says, you know, that there's somebody in the empire um, who's doing bad stuff. And, and he goes, who is this person? And she goes, Haman, in a kind of an explosive, powerful way. And so that's where we ended. So the evil nemesis has been exposed. Now what's going to happen? So let's turn to the text of Esther. Uh, and we are in chapter 7. So wow, you mean I actually have to turn more than one or two pages from the, from the opening? We're moving that fast. Wow. So Esther chapter 7. And we now find ourselves at verse 7 with Esther just kind of exposing Haman. And we continue. And the king arose in his wrath from the wine drinking and went into the palace garden. Aha. Uh -huh. So the king kind of walks outside. What do you think he wants to do that for? Yeah, cool off. Yeah. Because, you know, I mean, he's known to be hot headed, but he's also, that, that has also backfired at times. So. Okay, I'll, I'll go and I'm going to cool off and think about how I'm going to respond, what I'm going to do. Okay? But Haman stayed to beg for his life from Queen Esther, for he saw that harm was determined against him by the king. Okay, now, how does he know that? Because the king didn't say anything. Well, he's the king's right-hand man. He's the second highest, most powerful person in the kingdom. So he's able to read King Xerxes. And he, and he goes, oh man, I could tell this is bad. Okay? So in his mind, it's only a matter of how bad. So he wants, he wants Esther to, um, to kind of change things. But even though Esther exposed him, 
What he doesn't know is that Esther is Jewish. And the king doesn't even know yet. So remember early on, um, her uncle Mordecai said, hey, um, you know, keep this kind of on the quiet, on the lowdown, because, you know, it's not good to be known as being a Jew. So, um, so he said it'd be, it'd, it'd be in your long-term career interests not to reveal that. Okay. And so she kind of followed her uncle's lead. Okay. So, um, so as I wrote here, in a twisted irony, Haman begs for his life. The one who plotted death of the Jews is now in danger of death himself. Okay. Well, yeah. Hello. <laughs> okay. Let's look at verse 8. We'll only look at the, the beginning of, of, the, of the verse. And the king returned from the palace garden to the place where they were drinking wine. As Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was. Ooh. Now, we, we can't miss this in the Hebrew. And even in the English it comes across, but not quite as strongly. Recognize that he's not falling before Esther, but on the couch. And where is Esther? She, well, she's, eating, she's on the couch. Where they, they, you know, they ate reclining on the couch. Couches. And so, so he's, he's basically falling on top of Esther, begging for his life, okay? Uh, protocol is, is that you, you know, no one's allowed to, well, I mean, obviously the, her attendants are, but no one's supposed to touch the queen, okay? And, and so he's violating that protocol. So, you know, if you go to the king uninvited, if he doesn't grant you mercy, you die. And so touching the queen also is a grave offense. Okay? So, uh, and so Mordecai is doing that. Okay? And so, um, and so we, we, we don't want to miss that. Nafal in the Hebrew. Okay? And so, um, and, so this, and so here Esther kind of, as we've seen use of words littered throughout, or not littered, but used throughout the text, we can kind of see how the using the same words kind of connects things, okay? So Haman's falling re- recalls the prediction of his friends who twice used the same word, Nafal. If Mordecai, whom you have begun to fall, Nafal is a, of Jewish descent, you will not prevail against him, but will surely fall before him, except before whom is he falling? Esther. See, so what is the text subtly, subtly saying? Who's the real one exercising power here? Esther. Yeah, yeah. See, so, um, but um, anyway. So that is quite interesting. Okay, and so anyways, um, when the king comes in, we were going to hear an accusation now. Let's see if you think this is, the king actually believes this or he's using this as a pretense. So let's look at 8b, okay? And the king said, will you even assault the queen in my presence, in my own house? As the word left the mouth of the king, they covered Haman's face. Oh boy. So, what is he accusing Haman of? Yeah, assault. I mean, you know, the implications are, what are you trying to do, rape my wife when I go out into the garden? I, I mean, you go, well, that's totally ludicrous, right? And Xerxes knows it's ludicrous, right? So, my reading of this is that he's using this as a pretense. It just happens to happen. And, oh, okay. So this is a, he can get rid of Haman for, and he doesn't have to expose, at least immediately in his mind, he doesn't have to expose all that other stuff. Okay? So this is a clean, easy way to get rid of somebody he wants to get rid of, and he just gave the perfect pretext. So... Um, if everything was on the up and up, he, and something like this happened for some reason, he probably would be very angry at Haman, but, you know, wouldn't. So when a cover, cover says, what does that kind of sound like? 
course, you know, cover your face is, is kind of a, um, a kind of a kind of a symbol of repentance and shame, but it's also kind of what do uh, what happens a lot if you get abducted, or well, not you, but someone gets abducted. <laughs> yeah, and of course that freaks you out because you don't know where you're going. You know, you can't see, so you can hear stuff and you can feel movement, but. Um, and so it's very disorient, disorienting, and it's also, it also uh, unbalances you and just kind of amps up your emotions. So, um, so right there, it's like, oh, no, things are not good for Haman. Um, yeah, yeah. Let's, let's, so let's, let's kind of look at verse 8. I mean, we're going to now turn to... Um, well, okay, I really did kind of mess up. So, because I, okay, so 8b, but there are, there are a few more ver- verses. So, I don't know what's going on here. I guess when I was putting it together. And the king returned, okay, we read that. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs in attendance on the king said, moreover the gallows that Haman prepared for Mordecai, whose words saved the king, is standing at Haman's house 50 cubits high. Now, <clears throat> knowing what we now know about Haman, right? He's, he's kind of narcissistic, he's arrogant, he's full of himself. Remember the second, second uh, banquet or dinner that Esther hosted? He was in his mind, it, he was sure it was for him and how he was going to be praised for how good of a, you know, good of a leader and everything else he is, see? And so, um, and so here the eunuch says this, um, you know, he's, he probably hates Haman. And now here's a position where he could innocuously say something that will lead to his undoing, okay? And the king said, hang him on that, which doesn't mean hang him by a rope, but impale him. Okay, that's, and then of course you're impaled on the stick and your feet are pale on a, right? So, and they hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the wrath of the king was abated. So, okay. I guess I just wanted to skip those gruesome bits and go on to chapter eight. But yeah, yeah. So, so eunuchs, you know, what, will, what you'll find in, in kingdoms that, that um, palaces and kingdoms that had eunuchs, they actually wield a lot of power because, um, well, because they're trusted, right? And they don't waste their time uh, trying to find sexual gratification. So they make more efficient use of their time. <laughs> And spend their energies elsewhere. So, um, so I mean, so, you know, hey, I'll stop there. Chapter 8. On the day that King Ahasuerus, or well to say Xerxes, gave to Queen Esther, on that day, King Xerxes gave to Queen Esther the house of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. Wow. And Mordecai came before the king, for Esther had told what he was to her. Ah, oh, now the, see, now what's happening? So earlier Esther said, well, Mordecai was the one who foiled the plot for your assassination and somehow Mordecai was overlooked. Um, and, you know, so he wanted to reward Mordecai. And, and, but now what's happening is, of course, he, he now knows Mordecai and also that Mordecai's related to Esther. So now everything started to become clear. Okay, so, you know, he definitely wants... Mordecai in his inner circle, okay? And so, uh, so you know, when it, so Xerxes, so uh, if you die a traitor, then everything in the Persian Empire, everything became the property of the king, right? I mean, I think that technically still exists in Britain. If, if you die and no one is willed or you have no inheritor for your property, it becomes the queen, not the queen, it's now the king, becomes King Charles's, becomes part of all of his lands. And of course, over the centuries, you know, the kings and queens of England have, have had little bits of inherited lots of property that, that basically people died and it didn't go to anyone. So it became property of the state. And then, and then of course, so 
the amount of monies that, that those rents bring in is way more than, you know, that they, than, the, than the entire house royalty household costs. So, um, you know, so it's actually a good deal for the government if people, if people actually knew that being on a government stipend is actually saving money because all those rents go to the government. So, but not the king. Okay, so let's look at verse two. Why did I go into that? I don't know. Okay, and the king took off his signet ring, which he had taken from Haman and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther set Mordecai over the house of Haman. So who now is Mordecai? Yeah, the second highest, most powerful man in the king. He has a signet ring, okay? Which means that, you know, he could, he could either, you know, he can send out administrative orders basically on his own, okay? But he will need the king's approval to send out stuff in the king's name, even though um, he'll actually be doing the work most of the time. That's usually how, that's usually how it goes, right? So... <clears throat> Okay, and so he gave the property to Esther, but what does Esther do with it? Did you catch that? She set Haman, she set Mordecai over it. So she still owns that property. It's still in her name, but she's having her uncle kind of, why? Yes, yes. She's queen and, well... I mean, here you're the queen, and I'm not going to say you're a prisoner, but, you know, kind of sounds like it a little bit. So, I mean, so, yeah, the women in the king's harem. So, yeah, we don't even want to open that rat's nest, man. Okay, so that's the situation, okay? Now, we come across then, okay? So, we're going to... We're going to say, okay, so Mordecai's the, the second guy in all of the kingdom, and now we're going, to, we're going to see a couple uses of then in the text of Esther. And it's a little ambiguous as to how much time passes. And so this then, let's, let's read verse 3 and see, see what happens. And read between the lines. Then Esther spoke again to the king. She fell at his feet and wept and pleaded with him to avert the evil plan of Haman, the Agagite, and the plot that he had devised against the Jews. So Haman's dead, but the edict still stands. Okay, It's still floating out there on some day <laughs> that's specified. And so you have this entire population like, <laughs> when are we going to die, Right? When the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, whoa, wait a minute. Why is he holding out the golden scepter? Yes. Reading between the lines, she again approached him without permission. Now, from whom does she get permission? Mordecai. See, Mordecai is the gatekeeper. And so it's a very powerful position because you can keep people away from the king or just ignore people. Now, eventually, if word gets to the king that you've been keeping somebody away, away from him and he wanted you, then bad things will happen. But, you know, it's kind of hard to do that when you're the gatekeeper. So whatever passes, it's like Mordecai is now the most powerful man in the kingdom, and Esther has to go before the king uninvited. Something's wrong here. See, That's, this doesn't make any sense. Okay, so, um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, okay, anyway, so we read three. And then when the king held out the golden scepter to Esther, and then we're going to look at verses. But that's, that's kind of what's going on. So we're now beginning, okay, so now Mordecai, Mordecai's powerful. And what's the adage? Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Hmm. I'm, he's starting to look a little, little dodgy, a little sketchy. Because just, that's just a little breadcrumb that's just kind of 
dropping here, but it's kind of giving us a clue. Okay? So um, let's, let's look at verses five through six. Esther rose and stood before the king and said, if it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, well, that's what she said last time when she approached the king and uninvited. The exact same two. So what the text of Esther is telling us through rhetoric is that what seemed like, well, you know, it could be that she's, she has to approach the king uninvited. No, Mordecai's her uncle. No, no, that just happened. And then here, she's, it's the exact same thing. So this connects us back, and this lets us know rhetorically, oh, she did. See? So this is kind of smart use of rhetoric. Okay? Um, it, okay, if it please the king, and if I have found favor in his sight, but now, check out what she says. She adds two things. And if the thing seems right before the king, and I am pleasing to his eyes... Is she pleasing to his eyes? Did he not just hold out the scepter? Yeah, so, you know, Esther knows this, and she still wants to follow the protocol and everything, but yeah, okay. And if I am pleasing to his eyes, let the order be written to revoke the letters devised by Haman the Agagite, the son of Hamadatha, which he wrote to destroy the Jews who are in all the provinces of the king. For how can I bear to see the calamity that is coming to my people? Or how can I bear to see the destruction of my kindred? Okay. Notice this. How does she finish? Destruction of my people, my kindred. So what does the king now find out? Like, you're Jewish? I never knew you were Jewish. Why didn't you tell me? We can eat matzo balls together. No, he, no, just... Boo, boo, that's horrible, Pastor. Um, but yeah, so, you know, it was, the situation kind of warrants it. I mean, because now, if all the Jews are supposed to die, that includes her. Oh, well, this is personal now, right? I'm, I don't want an edict of mine to go out and ends up killing my queen, right? Isn't that the height of absurdity? So, yeah, so she basically lets everything out of the bag. But, oh man, Esther. <sighs> so let's, let's look on page three. And, and so we're going to look at a couple things. If the thing seems right before the king. Esther's so slick, man. Because she deliberately uses an ambiguous word which ha- can have several meanings. <laughs> So, I mean, she's, she's an astute politician. So, uh, you know, so kesher can mean proper, right, but also advantageous. And so it's like, oh, you know. Of course, she's not speaking Hebrew to the king, but the text is, right? Um, so, and so through ambiguity, Esther may suggest that the thing she wishes to bring up may be to his financial and political advantage. Remember how Mordecai based, you know, kind of bribed the king, saying, oh, well, when this happens, you know, he, yeah, he was going to confiscate the wealth and all of that of the Jews and then give a huge amount of it to the king, and he was going to pocket a whole lot. So now that's not going to happen. So Esther kind of uses some ambiguity to kind of say, but this could also be advantageous to you. Because, if, because he's not going to get all that stuff that Haman promised, right? So, oh man, okay? Second, she cleverly bundles her proposal with her being pleasing in his eyes. Of course she's pleasing in his eyes. And he wants her to remain pleasing in his eyes. So, so yeah, yeah. Now we're going to come across another then. And we don't know exactly how much time happens, but we, we can kind of, calculate later on how many days pass in total and in kind of this scenario. Okay, so let's look at seven and eight. First I have to find it. Then King Xerxes said to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew. So before Mordecai wasn't there and now Mordecai is. So this is a different 
This is a different meeting, a different setting, even though it's, you know, when we're reading, we think it just happened like, you know, a minute later, okay? Then King Xerxes said to Queen and to Mordecai the Jew, Behold, I have given Esther the house of Haman, and they have hanged him on the gallows, because he intended to lay lay hands on the Jews. But you may write as you please. That's y'all, yins, that's a plural. Okay, so he's not, he's, not, he's not directing this only to Mordecai, his, the second most powerful guy in the kingdom, also to Esther. But you may write as you please with regard to the Jews in the name of the king. So of course it has to go out with Mordecai's signet ring and everything else. Okay? Um, well, the king's signet ring, which is, you know, which uh, Mordecai is authorized to use. And seal it with the king's name. An edict written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's ring cannot be revoked. Well, the previous one to kill the Jews cannot be revoked. Which means what? You don't revoke the previous edict. You just stop it from happening or you nullify its effects, but you don't revoke it because that would undercut the king's authority. So, so now there's like political wiggling that has to take place. So how can we not make the king look bad because it was his edict officially, and how do we nullify it without undercutting the king's authority? Okay? So, um, yeah. What we're going to find out, let's look at 9 and 10. Because the edict, so even though it's, it has to have the signet seal that it's his edict, he said, y'all, you both, write it. So the king's scribes were summoned at that time in the third month, which is the month of Sivan, on the 23rd day. And an edict was written according to all that Mordecai commanded. Not Mordecai and Esther, Mordecai. So we get another picture of what's going on, right? We weren't sure whether if Mordecai was kind of keeping Esther away a little bit from the king, even though, you know. And then through use of rhetoric, oh yeah, yeah, okay, by repeating what she did earlier when she came in uninvited. And now only he is doing this. Now, not to say that he's not politically astute, but it's just, you can kind of see, now that he has this power, he's hogging it to himself, and even not doing things even as the king directed. Okay? Commanded concerning the Jews to the satraps and governors and the officials of the provinces from India to Ethiopia, 127 provinces to each province in its own script and to each people in its own language and also to the Jews in their script and their language, which would be Aramaic, even though they've, to a large degree, kind of lost a lot of that in, um, in the Persian Empire. Okay? And then, and he wrote in the name of King Xerxes and sealed it with the king's highest, with the king's signet ring. Then he sent the letters by mounted couriers riding on swift horses that were used in the king's service, bred from the royal stud. Okay, so it goes out using the Persian mail system, which is like the Pony Express. Fast, efficient, you know, with fast horses and they have stations and all of this stuff. So that way, it's a large empire, but you can get information out quickly because because of the way it goes out. So, and if, and if you can't, then, you know, in a sense, it's really hard to, to manage it. You're limited to how well you can manage a, um, an empire because of how big it is, right? So, what do we now find out? That the two thens end up totaling 70 days, okay? So, 70 days pass since Haman cast lots to determine the day of the Jews' destruction. Esther's first banquet occurred three days after Mordecai told her about Haman's decree. We now find out that some two months pass after Haman's death before Mordecai gives the new edict to stop the effects of Haman's earlier one. Remember, the earlier edict cannot officially be overturned. So this new one nullifies its effects, not overturns it. The second edict first gained traction because of Esther, right? She petitions the king, where was Mordecai? 
he's Jewish. Maybe he thought, well, we'll just let it just we'll just let it float out there, but nothing will ever happen from it. It'll be like a weird arcane law that, right? You're not allowed to spit on the sidewalk. Oh, but no one gets arrested for it, right? Oh, it's still on the books. Yeah. So he's going to let it go like that. Then the edict became Esther's and Mordecai's, but when writing it, only Mordecai did so, unveiling more about Mordecai's nature. Esther's success will be bittersweet. This is me writing. For she will fade into the background as Mordecai continues to see center stage. So the more, the text doesn't say Mordecai's a scoundrel, but it's becoming more and more evident that now that he has power, he could be corrupt, maybe not as bad as Haman, but he is becoming selfish with his power. Okay? And this is kind of bad, isn't it? Kind of worrisome. Hmm. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to, we're going to, we're going to take a look into the Septuagint because the Masoretic text does not contain the edict. The Septuagint, the Greek translation does. So where it makes sense to kind of look into the Greek text for any particular things that are happening rhetorically, we will. Okay? Um, and so we get more insight. It's, it's how can you nullify something without, without revoking it? Okay? So this is on the bottom of page three. We'll just go through this. The great king Artaxerxes to the satraps of the 127 provinces which stretch from India to Ethiopia to the provincial governors and all the faithful greetings. Who's writing this? Mordecai. And who are all the faithful? The Jews. Yeah, yeah. So you'll catch that if you're a Jew. But if you're not, it'll be like, oh, the loyal people in his kingdom. But he's using a, a term that, that the Jewish people know is meant for them in a quiet way. Okay? So, um, okay. So, uh, let's continue on. Many people, the more they are honored by the extreme bounty of their benefactors, okay, Mordecai setting up the stage. Who are the benefactors in this case? That would be the king and his power base, right? So the more they are honored by the extreme bounty of their benefactors, only grow more arrogant. That was true for Haman. Not only do they seek to injure their our subjects, but unable to cope but unable to cope with their good fortune, they undertake to plot against their own benefactors. So, isn't it, it's just odd that it's kind of written in this plural kind of way, even though really the benefactor is King Xerxes. So it's kind of, what, ambiguous and kind of letting him kind of wiggle and slide, slide out from some of this. So in other words, well, he doesn't, he, he's not, he doesn't take all the blame for being so, so, uh, Clueless, right? Plural, benefactors. Not only do they drive out gratitude from the human heart, but elated by the encouragement of people who are unacquainted with goodness. So, right, he's saying because of, read the subtext, because of how Haman was kind of doing thing in the king's name, the people in the Persian Empire became unacquainted with goodness. That's that's what's happening here, but it's all in kind of this political kind of flowery speechy stuff. Though this is pretty strong stuff, okay? Um, <clears throat> so not only do they drive out gratitude from the human heart, but elated by the encouragement of the people, meaning the people of the Persian empires who are unacquainted with goodness because Haman was a bad dude, they suppose they will escape the retribution of the all-seeing God. Okay, a little bone thrown in for the Jews. Okay. Often many of those appointed to positions of authority and trusting the management of affairs to friends and allowing themselves to be influenced by them, notice the plural. You can substitute it for the king. Right? The king, right? he appointed him to this position of authority and trusted the management of affairs to him who he thought was his friend and allowed, and allowed Haman to influence him, but it's plural to say, look, the blame goes all around, even though... The buck stops with the king, 
and he was the second in command to the king. So it's written in a way to basically not have all the bad stuff fall on the king. Okay? But it's pretty powerful stuff. But it's all speaking hypothetically right now. Okay? Um, influenced by them become accessories to the shedding of innocent blood. Oh. They involve them in circumstances without remedy, deceiving with false arguments the righteous intentions of the rulers. See kind of what's happening here? So it's, 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 it's these guys, but it's really Haman. Okay, so it's, it's a way to, to allow the king to save face, right? And saving face is pretty important. I mean, if you want, right? Um, like if we ever want North Korea to kind of peacefully become part of South Korea, we'll probably have to have some way where the dictator of North Korea can save face and give up his position of power. But if, it, but if he can't do that, pff, he'll bring all of his people and the nation down with him. So, you know, sometimes you have to like allow something like that to happen because, well, we don't want the entire people to perish, right? And so, um, so this is allowing the, the king, Xerxes, in a way to save face, okay? Benefactors, okay, that refers to the king. Often many, right? So that's kind of alliteration. Polacus de Kai Paulus, okay? So often many. You heard the term like hoi poloi, means the people. That, that's kind of like a term sometimes people use. Oh, hoi, the hoi poloi, the masses, right? Okay, uh, this phrase is an, is an intentional alliteration in the Greek language edict meant to highlight those who abuse their power. So I don't know what it would have been like in the Persian. We don't have a copy of that. Circumstances without remedy. Mordecai does not list what those specifically are, but the tone is that it's bad, right? Circumstances without remedy. Well, if it's without remedy, then what is the only remedy? Get rid of the person who caused this, right? But it's part of this subtext, okay? Deceiving with false ar arguments, okay? And that's really deceptive deception. Again, it's kind of an alliteration in the Greek. So, and it's for effect, okay? So, it allows the king some wiggle room not to kill the king, look what he did. No, it, it you know. It allows them to, to wiggle out of the responsibility. So it's written with a lot of, but the one who caused the circumstances without remedy, well, the only remedy is to get rid of him, which has already happened. Continue on with the edict. And you can observe this not only by examining the history of the earlier times handed down. No, you need only to watch the wicked deeds close at hand by the crimes of those unworthy of power. In the future, we will be on guard to maintain the kingdom undisturbed and peaceful for everyone, making new policies and always judging fairly in the matters coming to our attention. This is good and bad, right? Oh, we're going to run the kingdom properly, and we're not going to allow bad stuff to happen in the Persian Empire. Who's going to determine whether it's good or bad? <laughs> right? The king and his right-hand man and the people who work for him. Okay, so this is like, yay, oh, but it's a double-edged sword here. This comes with a bit of a warning, right? Because maintain the kingdom un undisturbed and peaceful for everyone. But if we think you're causing a ruckus, we're going to take care of that. We're not going to allow anything bad to happen. So again, in, in with kind of political finery, this is a warning. And so if you're living in the empire, you go, oh, you catch that. You know, okay, so this is explaining and this and that, but also warning, don't get out of hand because we'll take care of you too. But we're saying it in a nice way and we're smiling. Okay? Thus Haman, the son of Hamadatha, wait, a Macedonian? Wasn't he an Agagite? Yes. It's not a Macedonian name. <laughs> Doesn't matter. <laughs> what's, up with, what's up with Mordecai? 
just making up his ethnicity. Remember what's happening on the world stage. Who's the great threat to the Persian Empire? The Greeks. In particular, where was, where was um, Alexander the Great? Considered part of the Greeks, but actually he was Macedonian. He was like on the outer fringes of kind of the Greek, kind of the Greek world. He wasn't ethnically Greek, right? But he ends up what? Basically taking all the way to India too. Right, so it ends up becoming a huge empire. Um, and then, so yeah. So, so this is now coming, well, let's just blame it on the people the, who are the greatest threat to us. Because people know, wow, man, we got our butt kicked when we fought the, the Greek Navy. And it was pretty rough when we fought their army. Right? So it would be like... Um, you know, there's this big, it would be like, uh, you know, Ukraine and Russia, you know, they're at war. And everyone thought, oh man, it's going to just be three weeks and Ukraine's done. And yet this monstrous huge power actually is what? A hollow, I was going to say tiger, but hollow bear, right? With corruption within their system and everything else. And then with Europe and the U.S. helping Ukraine, oh, well, you know, with with better weaponry, they, they've really put up a good fight and they're recapturing territory. So in a sense, it's kind of, you know, like uh, um, Persia would be like Russia, the big powerhouse, but Greece is kind of like the Ukraine, except Ukraine, in a sense, is going to become, going to take over the world or something. I mean, if you, you know, in that sense, it's, it, you don't have a complete coherence. But we, kinda, we can kind of get that, okay? So, thus Haman, the son of Hamadatha, a Macedonian, without a drop of Persian blood. He had weird parents, man. Giving him a strange name without a drop of Persian blood? And he doesn't have a Macedonian name either? Well, he had weird parents. And far removed from our kindnesses, Enjoyed our hospitality. So all that bad stuff who caused the who caused the circumstances without remedy, that was Haman, a Macedonian. Oh, a Macedonian. Oh man. I I wonder if he was like a plant and put in there and right? Yeah. Macedonian collusion. Okay. Anyway. Why he received such a large share of benevolence we show to all peoples, meaning people in the empire. And you, that's generally true. I mean, the Persian Empire is not specifically mean toward other people or other ethnicities. If you don't toe the party line, you're in trouble. And if you follow the party line, it's going to be okay. Right? Yeah. Um, so, even being publicly proclaimed as our father, respected by all, second in dignity to the royal throne. Okay, so why does Mordecai distort Haman's ancestry and ethnicity? It's really easy. Oh, and then, you know, it just riles up all the people. He's Macedonian, oh, right? So, and then it'll just create a whole bunch of yelling and screaming and, right? So, um, Instead of saying, oh, well, he was somebody from our empire, right? So, yeah, this is really kind of slick. You know, just, anyway. So, <clears throat> I mean, stuff like that still kind of happens. So, uh, let's see, a few years ago, and you know, when, uh, w when Hillary Clinton became the presidential candidate, of course, there was a whole bunch of Democrats running, and, and there was uh, one Democrat named Tulsi Gabbard, whom I actually kind of like. And so, and after the first debate, she, wow, man, she was like, boom, and she trounced some people and other stuff. And the next day, she's an agent of Russia. Like, what? That's totally absurd. But it went out, and for some reason, it stuck, even though it was a total lie. So, you know, stuff can kind of go out, and it'll stick. Okay? So, there we have it. Um, so it, it's, it's the perfect sort of thing 
to kind of say somebody is a Macedonian and right? Okay. So, unable to restrain his ambition, he schemed to deprive us of our kingdom in life. By twisted methods of deception, he demanded we destroy Mordecai, our deliverer and constant benefactor. <laughs> Who's the author of this? Mordecai? <laughs> okay, now you're laying it on kind of thick here, Mordecai. You didn't have to actually say all that. Okay. Mordecai, our deliverer and constant benefactor, and Esther, the blameless consort of our kingdom, um, with their entire race. So now what was known but not stated in the previous edict is now stated that he wanted to kill all the Jews, which included the queen. In these ways, he expected to leave the Persian Empire little defended, helping guide the Macedonians to victory. So the way that this is spun now is that the Jews are good, loyal people. They make up part of, the, they're a good constituency of the, of the Persian Empire. And if we killed them all, it would weaken us and make us more susceptible to be conquered by the Macedonians or the Greeks. That's probably true. Maybe not a huge amount, but yeah, it would weaken the fabric of the Persian Empire. Okay? So, whereas before... What was, what was highlighted was, oh, well, this is a group that's distinctive and they have their own ways of doing stuff and they follow their own laws, meaning religion, but use the term laws to make it look like it's competing against the laws of Persia. So it's all a matter of the information you take and how you twist it, okay? So this is overstated, but Mordecai's edict is more accurate than Haman's in the sense that um, killing the Jews would bring harm to the Persian Empire. Yeah. Okay. So, in these ways, he expected to leave the Persian Empire little defended, helping guide the Macedonians to victory. Boo, Haman, we're glad he's dead. Still, is the former edict nullified? All it states was how bad Haman is. And you start out with kind of theoretical badness to specific badness, right? And how what he did was horrible. So let's continue. However, we find that the Jews consigned to destruction by this terribly wicked man are not criminals, but live by the most righteous laws. Not laws which undercut the Persian Empire, but the most righteous laws. We find they are children of the Most High, the great and living God to whom our ancestors, to whom our ancestors and we owe the continuing prosperity of our realm. Okay. All right. So, um, <clears throat> terribly wicked man. That's um, literally triple died. D Y E D. Uh, so what this really means is that Haman was such a bad guy, he was three times more evil than the average evil guy. How evil is the average evil guy? I don't know. But Haman was three times worse. See, so it's, it's, it's emphasizing again how bad he was, right? And uh, so we find that term being used in 2 Maccabees, right? To describe Nicanor. And he was one of Antiochus' general, if you kind of know the story of the Maccabees. And Antiochus had a hog slaughtered in the temple and that caused a big stink. And he, you know, and he, he made the Jews call him Antiochus Epiphanes, which means Antiochus, the revelation of God. And so, anyways, no wonder there was this giant rebellion. But so, but... So anyways, Nicanor, he was brought in, what, specifically to take Jews and sell them as slaves. See, so you can kind of get an idea of how, right, this isn't God, isn't just the enemy, but he was rounding up Jews and selling us as slaves. See, that kind of gives us context, okay? Well, we're going to stop right here. The edict, it, all we know is how bad Mordecai is and how bad it would have been for the empire. So... The edict of the effects of the edict, previous edict, cannot stand. And so Mordecai's really made a strong case for that. But as of yet, we don't know what that will be because I thought, well, we'll end the lesson here. So that way, the next two lessons are about 
the same length and we don't have like a really short last lesson. And uh, so any thoughts, discussion, questions? So, um, so what we'll find out is Esther will kind of fade more from the scene and Mordecai will kind of be the dude. Um, and it's kind of sad because more, I mean, Esther was, she's, she was the one who made all this possible and now that Mordecai has power, you ever like you ever like the two or three year old kids when they have a toy and you say, T-, you know, you, oh, time to put away your toy, mine, and they, you know, they get all red faced and veins bulge for the neck, mine, right? That's what Mordecai's doing, but as a man, <laughs> right? He doesn't want to. He doesn't want to let go or share his power. So, hmm? yes. Some of it, some of it, yeah. Um, so, um, you know, this is, this is going way more into detail. Um, and, it's, and, w- and when I say it's true, it doesn't mean every single thing they said. In other words, like the use of rhetoric, okay? You can definitely see that Esther, the text of Esther uses rhetoric for effect. So when she had an incomplete sentence and when Haman had an incomplete sentence, to, for effect, in real life it may have not been an incomplete sentence, but it was done to show, oh, Esther's hesitating and she's, she's still frightened and yet she still has the courage to do what must be done. Whereas for Haman, right, when he does all that, it's like, oh, he stops and he's savoring in his head like, oh, you know, how wonderful of a dude I am and all, how he's going to benefit from, you know, um, he's thinking about, all of the stuff that he's going to benefit when he pauses, right? So that may or may not have happened. I mean, that use of rhetoric or the specific repetition of words that are being used, that may or may not have happened. But this is part of the craft of storytelling. So we would call this not historical fiction, but historical nonfiction, but but it's told like fiction in the sense that that the narrative is crafted well and it carries us along in a good way and it leaves stuff out what isn't necessary like we found out today it was like 70 days what and it doesn't tell us the historical background of why this stuff makes sense but if you were listening we were the first time listeners you would know you, it was still fresh enough where you would know that oh yeah the greeks they're getting they're becoming the big dudes and i could see why you know all of this stuff makes sense that's going on so, um, you know, I want to qualify that, okay? And, and, and not to recognize the rhetoric that's being used actually makes us bad readers of Scripture, okay? Because then we're, in a sense, we're, we're failing to catch the stuff the writers of the texts want us to get. Because how do you convey information? I mean, how, when we're all talking, right? Well, we do that. We can have pauses. We can body expressions, facial expressions, or even a change of tone. A whole slew of things which you can't do all of that in writing. So you have to do that differently. And so if, if you just see it as just kind of a vanilla black and white text and you don't actually recognize the contours of what's taking place in the rhetoric, you're, you have a 3D photograph instead of a, a 2D photograph instead of a 3D color color rendering of something. But anyways, yeah, never ask a pastor a question if you want a short answer. So, any other thoughts or? Yeah, well, it's, I don't think it has. I'll share this with you. So when my kids were growing up and, you know, uh, it's homework time or whatever, right? And so they would, they would uh, go to Sherry and they would ask some question. I thought, well, I mean, this is like a history question. I, like, I know the stuff way better than, than, than Sherry does. And so I'm going like, well, hey, you know, why don't you, uh, you ask me? We don't want to know that much, Dad. <laughs> and there, there you have it. All I want to do is finish the assignment. I don't care about actually learning the stuff, right? And for me, it was like, I want you to learn the stuff. I mean... I wish I'd get a good grade, but to me, getting a grade was secondary to actually learning stuff, so yeah. That's just me, I suppose.
All right. With that, we'll close then, shall we? We pray. Our Father, it is a delight to kind of see the happenings going on in the lives of your saints in the Old Testament. Just how powerful and courageous and faithful Esther was. Even when she was powerful in her influence, we see that she was much more faithful than her uncle Mordecai. May we recognize who we always are as your people and strive to be faithful and not let us use whatever abilities we have only for our own advantage to the harm of others. May we follow Esther's example for she was such a wondrous saint in such circumstances. In our Savior's name we pray, amen.